the Bridge Connection. I'm glad you're with me today as we're going through. I think we'll finish up the 14th chapter today. Um, as we've been going through the Gospel of Mark from verse 1, been doing this for a while now. And we're in this chapter, we've gone very slowly through because we're walking on holy ground. We're watching Jesus and listening to his statements in just the last few hours of his life. What he's thinking about, we know what he's going towards and we, we see the hurts. We've talked about the, 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 the betrayal of Judas and, and um, all of the disciples running away and, and how, they were, how the people were treating Ju, Ju, uh, Jesus, the, the religious leaders and just uh, terrible things. And it's been very tough, you know, to, to go through this section and talk about it. Today, we're gonna pick it up verse 46. And we're going to look at the denial up here, uh, how he denied the Lord and what he did each time was three times he denied the Lord. And I just want to go from the, from the aspect of failing God is very, very serious. Peter failed Jesus in, in several areas and his failure reached its climax in an actual total denial of the Lord. But we're going to see eventually he was forgiven and there is forgiveness for any one of us who fail, any one of us who falls, any one of us who, who messes up. He's, he's forgiving us over and over and over again. Grab onto that, man. That thing that you, you've asked forgiveness for for so many times, and then you fall again and you don't mean to, and you wonder how God feels. He's, he, he's sorry that you've done that. He's, he hurts for you, but he'll give you the strength by his Holy Spirit to, to do it and try it again. And um, with, with his strength and, and your determination and, and your desire and your fortitude and God's strength, we can, we can overcome anything, guys. We're in verse 46, chapter 14, Gospel of Mark. Now, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. Now, we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna talk about his failures. He was there where he should not have been. He was with the crowd of, of rejectors. He was sitting with them and warming himself by their fire. We talked about that as the case would be in, in any similar situation. Um, the crowd was discussing the trial. They were mocking, they were joking, they were saying some very uh, incredible, nasty things about Jesus. and. Uh, because of his claims. Peter should have been off alone or else with the other disciples in prayer, maybe seeking an answer to the confusion. That's what we should do when we're confused. We should, we should seek an answer. God, what's the answer? What direction do I go here? Peter's failure seems to have been due to at least four things. I've kind of run this around several ways. We'll look at these four things and we'll talk some things after that that are important to add to it. He had a misunderstanding of God's word. In particular, he misunderstood the teaching concerning the kingdom of God. Now, Peter thought, as the other disciples did, that the kingdom of God uh, is physical and material, and that's all they thought. He failed to see the spiritual kingdom of God. That is, he couldn't grasp the death and resurrection of Jesus. He, he couldn't come to grips with with the Lord's indwelling power, his ruling and, and, and reigning within the human heart and giving us hope and direction. Um, he couldn't comprehend the idea of, of God making new heavens and new earth, which he would later understand in the clearest of terms. I love this verse in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. He says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So I think he, he didn't understand the Lord's word really saying. He was also confused. He had to be confused. Just a while before, Peter has, had drawn his sword and attacked one of those people who were arresting Jesus. He'd been ready to act in the flesh, to fight, to establish the Lord's kingdom. 
But Jesus had rebuked him and stopped him. So he's confused. I'll stand with you. I'll fight for you. He did that. Jesus said, no, that's not the way it's going to be. In addition, Jesus had, had not blasted his enemies nor, nor, nor made his move, but rather he had allowed them to take him, uh, voluntarily surrendering to their abuse. Peter just couldn't, couldn't grasp it, couldn't understand it. He was totally confused. His mind was reeling and, and searching for answers. What is this all about? And at the same time, there had to be some fear. Think about this. Peter had created a really bad situation for himself. He had attacked the arresting party. He had failed to wait upon the Lord's direction. He was acting in the arm of the flesh and, and doing what he thought best. Therefore, to some degree, he was now a hunted man. This is the one that took out his sword, began to attack the, the soldiers. In, in the scuffle, he had forsaken the Lord and fled for his life. But as mentioned before, Peter's great love, great love for Jesus and his great hope that Jesus might yet make his move had stopped Peter and turned him around. He followed Jesus, although from a safe distance. We saw that in verse 54. Throughout the whole incident, his heart had probably been uh, palpitating with, with fear. Fear of being recognized, fear of being arrested, fear of being on trial with Jesus and ultimately uh, being killed also. And obviously his faith was weak. Peter had failed to trust Jesus in the midst of confusing and threatening situations. Jesus was being tried. Jesus was being condemned to die before Peter's eyes. Yet Jesus had said to Peter that, that he would rise again. Peter had chosen to interpret Jesus' words symbolically, probably thinking Jesus was referring to rising up a kingdom to, after a struggle with the Romans, you know, symbolically viewed as, as death, the death of his enemies, of the fallen government. The point is, Peter literally, <laughs> the words of Jesus were literal. Therefore, his assumptions were based on error. So his faith was weak and uh, for all the events that he was, was, was about to grip his life. One thing will always cause great temptation, being with a crowd of rejectors, associating with a, a, a moving among the worldly as, as he was. He was sitting at their fire. He was warming himself there. He was listening to their conversation, whether it's talking or not, I don't know, but he was there, you know. Second Corinthians six seventeen and 18 says, therefore, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is un do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. Another couple of great verses. Um, actually, it's one verse. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse six. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. So there, there's four things that we see that can cause failure. Uh, we looked at them real quickly. It's just misunderstanding God's word. We're trying to interpret to the way that we want it, to prove something we want it to prove. Secondly, being confused by the situation, saying, what in the world is going on? This isn't the way I planned it. This isn't the way I know God didn't plan it this way. You know, I know what God would want for me and all this. Right? So being confused because all of a sudden what we thought was going to be just a, a level ground. Now we're climbing up a hill and then we're sliding down the other side into a pit. We're a little confused. And then the third thing is just we're fearful. We're fearful of where we're going, what we're doing, how this is going to end up. This, I don't know if this is what I signed on for. And fourthly, weak faith. And weak faith always comes back to number one, misunderstanding the Lord's words. When we misunderstand his words, then we have this weak faith because we have not um, grabbed on to what he was trying to teach us and what he was trying to tell us. All right, let's deal with all three denials of, of Peter, all right? That's enough introduction. Let's deal with all three denials. Let's pick it up at verse uh, 67. And when she saw Peter warming himself, this was a gal that was just part of the people watching what was going on. 
She looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And he went out on the porch and a rooster crowed. It's once, it's once. The first failure is that of fearing an individual and fearing that individual, not knowing who she was, where she was going, what she were, where she was gonna take this information, caused pretension. See, fearing an individual often makes a person pretend. Notice what happened. A maid simply walked up to Peter and said that he had also been with Jesus of Nazareth. There seems to be no threat of, of danger in this statement to Peter. At worst, it seems that it would have led only to some bantering or ridicule or you know people laughing at him or making jokes. The rejectors standing around were naturally bantering back and forth about Jesus and his claims. He claimed to rebuild the temple in three days and so forth. And, and in their minds and talk, he was but a fool. Peter had an opportunity perhaps to be a witness for Jesus, humbly sharing about the love and the enormous care of Jesus for people. Peter would have had so many stories. Perhaps he could have helped him turn some who were standing there to Jesus, or at least stop some of them from, from mob ridiculing. We must always remember that Jesus was somewhere in the place as well. And as far as we know, he was maintaining his composure and testimony of Jesus. Peter cracked under his fear. He denied Jesus, pretending he knew nothing about him nor had anything to do with him. He just claimed ignorance of the whole matter. I don't know what you're talking about, lady. Sit down and let's have some some words or something. But I, um, you know, I'm not. I don't know what you're talking about. See, the fear of ridicule and embarrassment often causes a person to deny Jesus. Sometimes the denial is by voice. Uh, sometimes the denial is by action, going along with the person or the crowd. Or sometimes the denial is by silence. We've all been there. When out of the world, it's easy to pretend not to know Jesus. There are people that profess Jesus on Sundays when they're among believers yet never say a word about him during the week. Or they know they don't live any differently from the world. No one ever knows they are professing believers. And such pretension, pretending, is totally denial. Look at Mark chapter 8, verse 33. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. It's also an interesting verse in Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord, whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. 1 Peter 3, 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give, a, to give a defense to everyone who asks. You are reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Let's go back to verse 69, all right? And the servant girl saw him again and began to say those things to those who stood by him. This is one of them. She said this, this is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean and your speech shows that your speech betrays who you really are. The second failure, the first one was of a person. The second failure is that of fearing a crowd. Fearing a crowd might sometime cause outright denial. The second thing about fear is that of fearing this crowd. Fearing a crowd sometimes just outright denial. It did with Peter. This time the, the maid recognized him said to the people standing around, this is one of them. The pressure upon Peter was stronger because a crowd was present. 
He denied it more emphatically this time. Matthew says, he divided, he, he denied it with an oath. Peter actually denied Jesus before men and he denied him using an oath. Instead of denying Jesus, he should have been upstairs in the courtroom, standing by the Lord's side and testifying for him. No, this is what he said. And these are the people he healed and that blind man and that leper. And he's, you know, and on and on and on. But Peter was falling. He was progressing more and more into sin. He was denying Jesus because he was not by his side. Instead, he was, instead he was down below under the, 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 in the courtyard and, and uh, instead of standing with Jesus, he was standing with Jesus' rejectors. He was standing among the Lord's rejectors because he'd fled the Lord. He'd fled the Lord because he had acted in the flesh. He'd acted in the flesh because he had not accepted the Lord's words. The Lord had told Peter and had told the others exactly what was to happen. Yet Peter had refused to open his mind to the truth. Therefore, he was utterly confused and caught off guard. We do the same thing. The Lord gives us direction, shows in the word. We know that can't be true. And sometimes we just, this is what I want to do, contrary to what God says as the Lord. Peter was fearing persecution. This was the first time he was standing face to face with life threatening persecution. And he was failing to stand. He was failing despite the fact that Jesus had told him time and again that he must suffer for God. That was part of what was going to happen. Peter followed Jesus ever so readily when Jesus was popular and he had a large following and people were always there. But he could not stand the heat when Jesus was being opposed and rejected by most people. Second Timothy chapter one, verse eight says this. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Deuteronomy 31, six, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them for the Lord, your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Back to Mark 14, we'll pick it up at verse 70. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and to swear. I do not know this man of who you speak. The second time the rooster crowed, then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. The third denial was the strongest and worst denial of all. The denial by, by cursing and, and swearing the charge was made by a, a crowd this time, a crowd who actually all came up to Peter to charge him. Luke says it, it happened about an hour after the second charge. That was, told us that over in Luke chapter 22. And John says that one of the persons in the crowd was a kinsman of, of Malchus. Now, Malchus was the one who Peter had cut his ear off in the Garden of Gethsemane. We're told that over in John 18. So, Notice that the time charge differed from the other two. Peter was no longer charged with having been with Jesus. He was now charged, one of them. You were one of them. One of the disciples, not just in the crowds. You were a disciple. Notice also that, that it was his speech, his accent that gave him away. Peter was from the north, from, from Galilee and his Northern accent differed significantly from the speech of Judea and, and Jerusalem. The denial by cursing and swearing was a terrible thing. A man who is put under pressure to prove himself often resorts to things like that. Notice what happened. Peter began to curse. 
His cursing was a continuous thing. Peter's failure was a, a deteriorating failure. His first denial was simply pretending not to know Jesus, simply uh, evading the issue. I don't know who you're talking about. Never met the man. I don't even know what's going on here. His second denial was stronger using a socially acceptable oath, although it was wrong under sin. His third denial declines into the depraved, cursing, totally unacceptable to righteous hearts and pure minds and clean lips. I found this quote from Dr. Alan Carr. It says, what Peter did was to take the name of the Lord in vain in the most serious way imaginable. When the Bible says that Peter began to curse and swear, it means that he invoked God as the ultimate witness to his denials of knowing Jesus. Peter may have said something like this, may God Almighty damn me to hell if I am lying. If what I am saying to you is a lie, may God himself take my life right now. We shudder to think of such a denial. But this is where spiritual weakness and, and compromise lead. If we're not careful, we can find ourselves in a place of utter denial. We may never vocally deny Jesus as Peter did, but I am certain that we all have denied him at, at some point with our actions, keeping our mouths shut, listening to that story, not saying anything about that incident. Each time we, we willfully engage, engage in sin, we've denied the Lord. It's a dangerous place to be, guys. One that always leads to devastation and regret. As soon as Peter had cursed and swore for a while, immediately the rooster crowed. A crowd of unbelievers can put pressure upon any of us. Peter was where he did not belong. He was hanging around in the midst of a worldly crowd. And the more we hang around them, the more we're going to find, you know, we get warmed by what they're saying and what they're doing. He belonged in one of three places, by the side of Jesus Christ, alone with God the Father, seeking answers and, and understanding, or with the other disciples, rallying them in prayer for understanding and direction. And then when I thought his speech gave him away, I thought, wow, would that be said of us? Our speech should give us away. Our speech should be kind, gentle, yet strong. Strong for the Lord. A person should be able to tell we are believers just by the way we talk, by our speech. Notice that Peter used his speech, his cursing, to try to deceive the crowd into thinking that he was anything but a disciple of this one that's standing over there that they're, you know, beating and stuff. Sin causes man to deteriorate. It causes him to deteriorate more and more and more. Notice what happened to Peter. Peter's first denial. He pretended ignorance. He simply sinned. Peter's second denial. He committed apostasy, infidelity. Peter's third denial. He committed perjury and blasphemy. Look at verse 72 again. A second time the rooster crowed, then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. Ooh, I love, I love what I saw here. Let me, let me share this. Man. The answer to failure is repentance. As soon as Peter heard the rooster crow, he called to mind the words of the Lord. That's what it says. And remember what the Lord said. And then he thought about them, it says, and he wept. The word thought there means to throw upon. Peter threw his thought upon what Jesus had said, that he, Peter, would, would, would deny Jesus three times. Peter's mind was, was, was fastened upon what Jesus had told him. His mind would quickly not let Jesus' words go. 
Quickly, emotion and sorrow began to arise in his chest and he felt the tears begin to come. He'd failed his Lord. He'd failed him so miserably. Peter loved the Lord and he somehow, and somehow he knew that he was not where he belonged. He might understand, not understand, you know, what was, what was happening to the Lord and the course the Lord had taken, but he should have been by his side all the time, testifying for him as fast as he could without attracting attention, I'm sure. He made his way out of the courtyard and as soon as he reached the outside, he burst into tears. <laughs> the Greek is descriptive in describing Peter's repentance through godly sorrow and weeping. The idea is that Peter was utterly heartbroken and added weeping upon weeping. That's how you would say it, weeping upon weeping. He wept and the more he thought about the situ situation, the more he wept. He fell to the ground and wept, being heartbroken. He wept being grieved with hurt and pain. It was totally unbearable. He wept and he continued to weep. Aren't you glad we have verses in the Bible that say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1, 9, Proverbs 28, 13. Very important verse. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. I just want us to be people who confess our sins, forsake them, and walk in the mercy and grace of God. I know we've all blown it at times. I know we've denied our Lord just through keeping our mouth shut or, or opening it up when we shouldn't have or not meeting a need in the name of Jesus and not reaching out and embracing somebody or so a variety of ways. But the good news is, as we repent and surrender to him, sometimes it, it that causes my, that causes weeping. You don't have to weep, but there's something about a closeness with the Lord when you realize what you've done. There's there's a repentance sometimes, and I, I find myself weeping. Like I say, it doesn't say you have to, but there's just something in that cleanses me. You know the um, importance of not performing. It's not how loud you pray or how much you cry. It's how you walk with Him that matters as you surrender to Him. Lord Jesus, we close this time together today in awe at what, at what you have done for us. Lord, we, we look at the denials of, of Peter and we could put us in his position and we could be guilty of everything that he was guilty, but Lord, you forgave him and you used him so mightily in your kingdom the rest of, the life, or the rest of his life. Lord, I'm thankful for that. There's some of us right now as we're closing in prayer, we just want to give you our failures, our denials, empower us, fill us fresh with your Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, that you would lead and guide and give us words to speak, that we would boldly speak the truth because the only answer to this world right now is the truth of Jesus Christ who has come to redeem us from our sin. So Lord, we want to be part of that. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you. It's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. See you next time. We'll start in chapter 15, okay? God bless you.